there, sort of chronologically, with Elizabeth Fagan, who's standing in the back of the room, who was one of the Columbia students in one of those studios, and brought the first draft and all of the photography together, and really got the project launched. She is now the Lamar's Preservation Commission, which is a good spot for her to be. Uh, but it would, it really was, it, it has been an enormous job and she really got it rolling. So thank you, Elizabeth, very much. <laughs> Um, she is an enormously energetic person who picked up where Elizabeth left off and brought this to conclusion, which is an enormously detail-oriented job. You just can't imagine all the things you have to remember and get right. Uh, so we're have been enormously blessed to have Sarah um, finish it up for us and bring us to this point. amazing because she keeps all the other balls in the air. We're not, we're actually not a historical society. We wouldn't know that from looking at what we have here in front of us tonight. But um, Rachel has, does all the other things that, that go on around all the advocacy that we're involved in. She's a planner by training, which it turns out to be just the perfect person to have as your bill is being uh, altered a lot by in good ways and bad, but ones that we want to control and make sure we have it right. Um, you will uh, meet our panelists uh, shortly, but you already met them. They're already in the video. But I wanted to point out a couple of other people who were in the video. Rick Donovan is your site. Oh, make it. There he is. All right, Rick's over there. He's sorry. You know, there's Adam. Thank you for giving us your time. And Kathy Adal was there, not Marty Daryl. Welcome um, again, Kathy. I wanted to point out some friends, board members who are here. Um, Andy Stephan and his wife Patsy are here at the back. Thank you for coming. Um, Peter and Polly Mark, who is the board member, and Polly, his wife, are here. Thank you. Um, Sarah Chu is here with her daughter. She's a bright red unicorn. And, um, uh, and Rita Chu, they're not related, are, are also board members who are with us. And I, who am I missing? Jean. And Jean, sorry, I have it written down right here, Jean Sloan. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a unusual program, a unusual project for friends, uh, a little outside of what might have been our comfort zone, but the board has been just wonderfully supportive, and I think we're all excited to, to have it. Um, so now our panelists, I think what we'll need to do for some people can see, if you don't mind, um, is to stand up, and we're just going to do this standing, because I think Seat. Are you going to bring some seats forward? Yes. But move these seats around. Okay, move your seats around if you would, and um, and then we'll all need to use the microphones. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, and we have to share knows as much, if not more, than anybody else on the planet about that subject. Um, but more to the point. For, for me and many other people in the room, um, he's been a professor and a teacher for decades. Got some feedback here. Yeah. Um, for decades, inspiring students, including me, um, to learn about New York City and its history, and, and take the lessons to learn about other parts like of our heritage. So thank you, Andrew. Um, Gregory Dietrich uh, is right there. Uh, Dan Gregory is a preservation consultant who serves a lot of clients in a variety of different ways. But for us, um, he dove into a lot of the primary uh, and secondary sources in our institutes. He did a lot of primary source research for us that brought real validity and clarity to a lot of the, particularly the earlier history of Europe. So that was invaluable, and he did it under a time pressure that was quite considerable. So um, we're very grateful to Gregory. Um, Father John Camus, I think you can tell which one he is. Um, uh, Father John is also a, a, a friend of the Upper Side board member. Um, he's the pastor at St. Jean Baptiste. And he is a lifetime New Yorker, as you understood from the uh, video. And uh, our council member, whom I think you probably all know, or you do now, is Ben Kalos, and also a lifetime Yorkville resident. And, uh, he was the one who really inspired us to do this. He believed in the immigrant story. He wanted to get it out. He thought it should be done. He thought it could be done. And he thought we could do it. And I hope we have done him proud. And we are grateful to him for that inspiration. 
and also for the, uh, the funding that he arranged through the Cultural Immigrant Initiative. fairly conversational and relaxed. Uh, when we've done a, a number of those, you will have a chance to ask some questions. Well, there are probably going to be more here than we can possibly deal with, which is why you have those cards. So if you come up with a question, Rachel's going to hand those out now. Um, if you have some questions, write them down and we'll collect them. Um, this is not the end. The book is published, the video will be online. But I look at this as the beginning, a beginning of a conversation with people in the neighborhood uh, who can ask questions, can give recollections. We'll be doing this online on our website and perhaps a blog. I'm not sure quite what form it will take, but we intend for this to be uh, a, the beginning of a, a deeper plunge into the history of your and its people. And I want your memories, I want your grandmother's memories. Uh, we want to get all of this uh, into our archive that will keep, uh, we'll keep growing. Okay, yeah, uh, some question already? <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Um, no, just, the, it's, it's a two part question, and it's, you brought it up before. Um, where does your bill start? Oh. And, and, and what it, what's the boundary lines? Because to me, I, I go up to Central Park. Right. Um, for our purposes, we have said that your bill goes from Third Avenue, which was um, where the elevated train went up and became a big fence dividing line with the western part of the city. So we say 3rd Avenue, and we have said and done research from 72nd Street essentially to 96th Street. Now within that, of course, there is Lennox Hill. Who would like to try to tell me exactly where Lennox Hill begins and ends? I wouldn't try it. Um, so it is, if these things are all a little mushy, I mean, some people will probably ask you to say that we also stop at 79th Street. Then you leave a whole all sorts of immigrant populations that uh, use the yeah. And then we have St. John Baptiste, which is on 76 in Lexington. And so is that considered? Um, well, that giant. Yeah. <laughs> <Later. laughs> I would like, like to tell you that this is Zephyr Ryan sitting next to you today. So um, his great great grandfather was involved in building that church. See, there you go, right now, and you got up and you got to go come at you. Go come at you. Um, I, I want to start with, with Andrew. We'll, we'll get to, back to that. I want to start with uh, Andrew Gogart, who knows more about New York City neighborhoods than uh, anybody from, from Washington Heights to Brooklyn Heights and everything in between and beyond. You may have said it in the video, but what is, what's special about your film? And is it, is it different from other immigrant neighborhoods, or is it really of unusual place? Well, I think that there are things about Yorkville that are similar, uh, particularly in the, in the form of, of the tenements, because tenements follow the laws, and so they're, they're built to what the law requires. Pre-law, old law, new law, tenements. So that's something that is very similar. I've done a lot of research working with the Tenement Museum on the Lower East Side, and currently my students are working in the West 40s in Hell's Kitchen, <coughs> and so much of the tenement fabric is, is, is similar. And I suspect that if we really delved into who the architects of the tenements were up here, it's probably the same group of mostly German immigrant architects. But what I think sets Yorkville apart from other immigrant neighborhoods, and, and what I alluded to in, in, in in the, my comments in, in the film, was that more than in other immigrant neighborhoods, you can read something of the ethnic history in the, in the buildings. Not in the tenements so much, but because um, there's such diversity of immigrant groups on, in Yorkville, which is not the case in, other, in some other immigrant neighborhoods, there is this concentration of mostly institutional buildings and some commercial buildings the, or commercial operations, the, the stores, that create more of a diversity of, of ethnic experience uh, in Yorkville. And this is why I, too, had been advocating with friends to do this kind of study, because there are very few areas where there are so many different ethnic churches, for example, and ethnic social halls that, that tell us today about the history of this neighborhood in the past. 
And I think that that's why it's not only important that we recognize these in the book and in the video, but that we preserve these um, as, as well, both because some of them, like the, the Slovak church or the Jan Hus church, are really beautiful works of architecture, but even separate from that because they are great culture, they're great entrees into the cultural history of this neighborhood and what our past was. And I think that it's really crucial that we, as we move forward, remember those aspects of the past that created the neighborhood. So I think that that is evident in Yorkville more than in any other uh, immigrant neighborhood uh, in, in New York City. Um, Gregory, I have a question for you. I wonder if you could describe to our audience some of the primary source research that you did, the kind of things you look for. Um, what didn't you find? Are we still looking? Uh, we probably are. Uh, it's, it, why don't you just describe that, that part of the task? Well, I'd like to start by just saying that I find the New York Public Library System, and in particular the main branch, to virtually be one-stop shopping with respect to really getting the foundation for any research project. And in this case, um, we not only have certainly just a whole plethora of books that have been written about immigrant trends in New York City, um, and then you've also got specialized collections, of course. And they do have a specialized collection on Yorkville, albeit rather limited. Uh, but they do have newsletters from the local Yorkville community um, group that were certainly helpful. I would say the second task was to really drill down, of course, into these immigrant groups, specifically to the area. That was a bit of a taller order that uh, took me outside of the public library and over to the Lennox uh, neighborhood uh, house archives which are housed at Hunter College. And fortunately, they have the complete set of annual reports. And what is, I think, tremendous about that collection is that they are very plugged into the local community and the various groups that were living in Yorkville between the 1890s, um, certainly up through 1950s and beyond. Uh, so those were enormously instrumental in really getting a sense of the different nationalities and their different needs and how they were addressing them. Sounds like I get something. Please. There's something about that that relates to what, what Gregory was just saying that I think is really important because we have this tendency, and, and uh, the video says this, that you know, the, the Hungarians were in one area and the Czechs and Slovaks were in another group of blocks <coughs> and the Germans were in another group of blocks. But really it's not so broken down like that. And I think one of the most telling things is if you, uh, if you, if you get the book, which I hope all of you will, there is a, a census page and it shows you one tenement and the diversity of peoples that were living in that tenement. There are, are, are uh, Germans and, and uh, the, what are referred to as Austro-Bohemians and uh, Russian Yiddish speakers and Italians and Irish all living in the same building. So although there were concentrations, I think it's really important to understand that, that people were mixing um, as, as well and that, that it wasn't like what, one group, then the next group, then the, then the next group. And I think that that is what is a really exciting aspect of the neighborhood. And, and I do realize that there was a part two to your question about um, what more? <laughs> what, where could the research go from here? Uh, I would say just in terms of what I was trying to find that the uh, link between the Hungarians and Yorkville was something that uh, could have gone further, possibly through just locking myself in a room with census data and going through street by street to really get a sense of the occupations. So I felt that that would be something. I, I think there's a panelist at the end here who could help you on your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I have a question for, for Ben and, and Father John. Um, among the famous, very famous uh, residents of York were the Marx Brothers, all did a uh, generation or two before you. But they described a neighborhood that was actually quite rough, uh, rough and tough in many ways. And I wonder if you uh, both, you all, and Rick, you too, speak very fondly of the neighborhood, but was there that element in your growing up time, a tougher, a crowd? Uh, well, 
I don't know, I never experienced it, but I was never allowed to go down York Avenue. <laughs>
we have these industrial schools that are established by the Children's Aid Society. These are not just focused on um, orphans, but of course in this neighborhood, immigrant orphans. And the idea of teaching them trade at a very young age so that they can be productive members of society. So this is actually predating the progressive movement uh, per se. Uh, but then once we have sort of this progressive movement that's uh, coming alive during the late 19th century, uh, essentially what we're seeing is, for lack of a better word, maybe the institutionalization of progressive reform. And what I mean by that is this idea of municipalities sort of taking the lead and now saying, yes, we believe that we need to address issues about education, um, hygiene, sanitation, uh, and especially this idea of wanting to integrate uh, in the immigrants into society, into American society. Right, the colonial days, they, they were very big proponents of this idea of, of being able to uh, teach immigrant cultures about American history and values. So we see that, uh, as we saw in the documentary, manifested specifically in Yorkville in the advent of public schools uh, designed by the master architect C.B.J. Snyder for the New York City school system, early 1900s, and then, of course, um, Andrew Carnegie's uh, incredible philanthropy <coughs> in the library system. Um, I don't know, Andrew, if you had any thoughts just about the proximity between Carnegie Mansion in Carnegie Hill and, and the Yorkville branch, possibly? Um, I don't know. I mean, Carnegie was building libraries all over. I mean, yeah. So I don't, I don't just that it's the first here. That's yeah. right. I think that, that one of the really interesting things, which relates to what I said before, is that all of these progressive era, going sort of semi philanthropic organizations, they, these these groups thought that architecture was ennobling, uh, and and that so that they, that they weren't going to put up just crummy buildings. That, that they had to build something that was beautiful. Uh, and you can see that in the, in the Carnegie libraries, in the public schools, uh, and that were built not only in this neighborhood, but all over the city, in buildings like uh, the, the, the Female Guardian Society, which is now, I think, St. Elizabeth of Hungary Church. Um, and, and, and so there's this concentration, and particularly around 79th Street, where you have city and suburban homes, and the, the the, the um, East River houses, the, the Cherokee apartments, and there was another model tenement complex that's now gone, and you had the library and the school, and John Jay Park, which was also a progressive era uh, park, and there used to be a settlement house that remains in sort of a, a fragment still there. So there's this whole grouping of, of buildings that were built to be solid and, and to express something about the, the, the aspirations of both the, the philanthropic groups and the people that were using the buildings. And Ben and John, do we still have that spirit of caring and outreach either municipally or through private institutions in New York now? Do we still have that ethic? Yeah, I, don't, I don't feel it too much. Yeah. No. Uh, the, the tenement, I grew up in a tenement, and uh, there, uh, I was living in between the Greek cathedral and the Andrews Church. That's where there, there were four tenements there. And um, uh, in the building, we had Czechs and Slovaks, but then we started having Greek immigrants, and they were coming, they were very poor. I, I know the church was in some way, because uh, the church owned those tenements, so they were putting them in there to, to assist them. And now it's getting harder and harder to find a place for anybody. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you... You're making me miss a time I've never known. <laughs> I would say that we rely on the infrastructure that was placed a hundred years ago by a progressive era. We literally just rebuilt PS 158, which I saw in that picture. Our town just did a story on the fact that at PS290, also in this picture, which was not built with the gym, the children play in the streets. And that was something that is part of our neighborhood's cultural heritage. 
And every now and then, the NYPD shows up and says, why are their children playing in the streets? And we have to get a new letter from the Department of Transportation that says, no, no, here it's OK. And there's other locations throughout it. But I, I, I've dealt with the, 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 the Rockefellers and, and the, the so on and so forth families, but they haven't come to say, we'd like to just give you a new park. They haven't come to say, we need a new library, let's build a new school. Oftentimes, it's we want something from the government, and uh, we're able to work with organizations such as yours and the community to determine if there's a price that they can pay. Sometimes the answer is absolutely not. But actually, I'll, I will tell you a secret. My first year in office, a developer showed up and said, I want to demolish 158 and do something there. And I said, no. And they said, well, but I, I want X, Y, and I said, no. And they said, well, what can we do? And I said, but there is no price. And they said, okay, well, we'll wait you out and we'll wait eight years to see if you can buy a new elected official. But it's one of those pieces where no one's coming to say we want to help you restore and, and preserve 158 because so many generations of our family came there. It's, well, we'll, we'll, we'll raise your heritage and we might give you a, a new school instead of investing in what's already there. Uh, and I, I would just say, that being said, there, there are one or two developers where if you get enough news about a lack of infrastructure in the neighborhood, for us, the fact that we didn't have any pre-K seats, uh, the developer in question said, well, I can't sell the units here at, at $4 million for a one bedroom if there's no pre-K. So that's bad press. So they actually said, well, we will let you rent pre-K on the first floor of the brand new building. So we've only been able to try to appeal to the self-interest of the developers that they might make space available for the infrastructure that our district desperately needs. And I just, I, I would love that. Different I think maybe the one success story uh, on that level is the uh, Bohemian National Hall. Uh, my parents had their wedding reception there in 1946. And it was interesting because we awarded them, uh, it was for many friends, when they finished the building to forever. Uh, but they really restored it beautifully. So I gave them my parents' wedding picture uh, as, a, as a little gift when we gave, awarded them. And they put it in the restaurant. So if you go to the restaurant, you look at the pictures, and you see a thousand people all lined up at tables. Uh, for a wedding, and you'll see uh, John Camus there, my father. But it's also interesting, uh, there was no catering. So my everybody in my family brought food. So uh, it was a, a different way, but it was a neighborhood place. I remember going there as a kid, the Bohemian National Hall, 73rd Street. Yeah. So, so to, father, to, to Father John's recollections, and also to Andrew's admonition that we take a look around. That, I hope the book will help you do that. These buildings are not buried, but they are often mid-block. And they're, they're incredibly special and have very rich, deep, long histories and stories behind them. Uh, Bohemian National Hall, you can go in, and it is programming itself with more and more interesting things that are there on Friday. So I, I really recommend it, it is also just stunningly beautiful. Uh, it has been a long, long, hard effort. Where's the very um, uh, of the, the leadership there, and it, it is succeeding. So, uh, you know, you can get out and look around with your book in your, with our book in your hands, and uh, go inside when you can uh, to look at some of these remarkable places. Um, let's just go back for uh, maybe one last question, and I'll, I'll open it up to some others. What did the what did the landscape here look like before the uh, elevators came along? We don't. You know, it's not the kind of thing people picture. Very, we we show it very quickly, and you'll see a little bit. You'll see the map, the same map that's here, that show the tracks being going. Um, you'll see in the book. But, but describe what that really would have looked like. So, what's interesting about the area is, of course, one can look at historic maps and get a sense of sort of the topography. Uh, but I have to say, frankly, mm -hmm. that it was your thesis oh. that she wrote on the line letters. Um, that actually gave a pretty vivid description of this very sort of rocky, uneven terrain. We certainly know it now because we see these pretty big slopes uh, from at least part of the hill 
uh, down to the river. And that was uh, largely what we were talking about. Um, I would like to just say three phases of development. So the first one is 18th century, 17th, 18th century. Uh, you've got the development of the country states that are just sort of standard in the area. Uh, and then in the second phase, um, essentially, Norfolk becomes sort of what would be like a little factory village. Um, for some reason, uh, carriage makers sort of like this area and settled here. Uh, and then there was the rise, of course, of the neighborhood churches and uh, a local volunteer fire department. And then the third phase is uh, certainly embracing this uh, immigrant culture, this multi-ethnic culture in the neighborhood, which is uh, largely triggered by, uh, we were talking about the elevated trains, but even before that, uh, 1830s, there are horse-drawn rail cars uh, that go up uh, what is, of course, State Park Avenue in a trench that is cut within the uh, thoroughfare there. So that's the earliest, and that certainly brings uh, development to this area. If all of you who have questions could just move your cards to the aisle so Rachel can get them to um, get to your questions. But that, that last picture of the, uh, the cut, the railroad cut in what is now Park Avenue, gives you a sense, you, you read, people describe this from imperial literature and memories, uh, of the divide, there was a physical divide from the western part of the Upper East Side that became the Gold Coast, that everybody thinks of when you hear Upper East Side, you know, the average person in France doesn't think of Yorkville. Um, and the rest. So first there was the, the Park Avenue Trench, uh, and then there were the elevated trains. Uh, and that, that really created a, a different community on the east side. So I promise we're going to keep all of your questions uh, if we don't get to them tonight, which we won't. And we will be continuing to have this conversation online uh, and probably live as well. Um, so, oh, here's one. What uh, can you tell us about Doctors Hospital on East End Avenue and the role it played in the immigrant community? Anybody, any of the panelists know? Anybody in the room know? My mother, my mother used to say that's where the rich people were the best. That's what my mother used to say. I think it was uh, as a private hospital because it was for the rich. And you could drink there. <laughs> said it was okay to drink there. Um, any other um, less frivolous memories? As for the hospital, where that high rise went across from Gracie Mansion. And, and remember, that side of the, of the um, neighborhood was not savory. There was uh, a lot of uh, transportation to be instructed on the river. Uh, there were factories, some of them pretty nasty, so it took over. So that East End Avenue is as classy as it is now, is a recent, is a recent development. Uh, is there any help for protection for small business owners, restaurants, etc., being forced out by huge rent increases or developers? That is a citywide concern as both residents and businesses are feeling gentrified and pushed out. I will share an accident of history which is very interesting. So on 86th Street, we had all these German businesses there and the community board of eight and wanted to protect them. And so the first incident of mom and pop zoning which restricted the storefronts is on 86th Street. And what was interesting is my memory of 86th Street was we needed an air conditioner, so we went there, and there were all these electronic shops. And you would go between the different people, the folks would come out in different languages and argue and haggle. And somewhere around the 80s, the community board said, well, we wanted to save the German cultural groups, and this is at least as I've been advised by the Department of City Planning, but we're no longer interested in those same protections. And so, um, and I see community board members who might have more information than I do here, uh, but the protections were lifted, and now we see this very big box, 86th Street, that is part of what 
move the border north to 96th Street. Uh, Borough President Gail Brewer on the west side brought in the mom and pop zoning, and there have been multiple studies that have all somehow come back as somewhat inconclusive about whether or not reducing it. I think there was a study by the county, the Department of City Planning says they won't study it because it, it hasn't been long enough. It's only been five years. Uh, the City Council did a study to say it's hard to determine, but they have seen that the stores that are there weren't necessarily pushed out at the same rate as everywhere else in the city, but there was still attrition. So that being said, uh, I believe the best thing sometimes an elected official can do is say, I don't know. <laughs> I'm interested in working with you. And uh, we, we've taken funding from my office and, and made it available to planning organizations like this one and others to try to see if there's actually a solution that we can use. I'm a big believer that infrastructure in the built environment can determine human behavior. Here's a question from maybe for John, or John. Um, how, how did the SDR change the area at all? Remember when the MTL went? I'm not that old. <laughs> Enjoy those and enjoy each other. Thank you.